Hi, everyone. Welcome to our type two panel this afternoon, or maybe this evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I want to welcome you all today and describe how the session is going to go. So we are here with some of the um, nation's experts on diabetes today here to answer really your questions um, right here live. And I think, you know, I said it this morning in the in the opening session, but I always think of back to school time of year as kind of a fresh start. And I think that's so perfect for diabetes because it's really kind of what everybody can kind of get burnt out and kind of be doing the same old thing. So I think this is the perfect time to kind of reboot you, get you recharged about your diabetes. And here and now you get to kind of ask all your questions that you may still have um, from the day. So the way this works is um, I'll let our panel introduce themselves in a minute, but we have a chat box here. And in the Q&A chat box, if you enter your questions in there, I will read them out loud to our panelists and we'll get some answers. Don't worry if you've put a question in the chat box that maybe is you know, too personal for the live panel, or if we don't have enough time to get to it, we will be answering all the questions um, afterwards. So don't worry, you will get your questions answered at some point. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. Uh, Lorena, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? I think some, some of our viewers probably already know you from earlier today. <laughs> yes, I'm Lorena Drago. I'm a registered dietitian, nutritionist, and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Um, I help persons with diabetes to manage their conditions and get the crazy thoughts about food out of their heads and onto their plate. Uh, and I am in New York, so I'm all the way from the East Coast today. Excellent, thank you for joining us, Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa McGuire. I'm a registered nurse and a certified diabetes education and care specialist. That's a mouthful. I'm, I've been a, a certified diabetic educator for 30 years here in the Kansas City area. And I currently work in a cardiometabolic center working with risk reduction for those living with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So happy to join uh, the wonderful panel today. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here. And those are certainly you know, both of you are certainly involved in really the hot topics for diabetes right now. So um, I'll start with the first question here, which says, are you supposed to do a postprandial, that means after eating, um, blood sugar check two hours after you start eating, which is a good question. I think sometimes it gets confusing. And maybe I'll broaden this out a little bit and say, what do you tell your patients about checking their blood sugars? Is it better to check before? Is it better to check after? You know, how do you, how often should our patients be checking? Which I know is not kind of a one word answer. Uh, I'm going to take that question and just, uh, and I have type, you know, I usually work with type ones and type twos. So many times it's an issue of insurance. So let's, that, that's the most practical issue that comes. And uh, so, and then some others have the CGMs, which are so, so useful. So there's really not the one and two hours because they can actually see what's going on throughout those two hours. But if you are using a glucometer, then I always say try to do it one once before and then two hours after the meal so that you can see how it's working for you. And if this is not something that's feasible because you don't have the strips that you may need, then at least do it for two days before and after, and then see if you start seeing trends and patterns, which is, which is the most important um, aspect of checking to make sure what, what is working and what needs to be tweaked. Yeah, I, I love that answer. It's all about pattern management. And some, some folks are, you know, in, in the position where they have enough strips and others don't due to insurance and costs. So we really have to make that work for you. And one of the other things we do um, is sort of that focus three days before an appointment with a practitioner so that you can bring that, you know, current data in. So really make it work for you. But I agree, you know, looking at that pre-meal and two hours post-meal really kind of helps with that, that 
pattern recognition and also some feedback, really great feedback. When I, as you know, Lorena, when, you, when I eat this, it does this, but when I eat this, it does this. So really make that work for you, so. Yeah, I could not agree more. You know, I think to ask our patients to, especially the ones that don't have a continuous glucose monitor, which I know we've talked a lot about CGM today, but if you don't have a CGM to, to really take out all your materials and, you know, prick your finger five or six times today is a ton, right? That's a lot of work. Um, and I think to ask our patients to do that on a daily basis is a lot. And also most people don't have the test strips as you, as you, you know, mentioned, but those patterns are key. And I think what you said, Melissa, about, you know, doing it for a few days before you go into any of your providers, your diabetes educators, your doctors, your nurses, because that way they can have kind of current data and then don't change everything you're doing just because you're, you know, going in to see them in a few days. I always tell my patients, you know, take those meals that you love, take that pizza that you love to eat or the, the ice cream you love to eat and check before and after and see what happens. See what happens if next time you eat one slice less of pizza and, and what happens to your blood sugar, you know? And I think that gives us an idea of kind of what's happening as you were alluding to, um, instead of saying you have to do this every time of day, every single day, it's, it's just a little less, you know, check before and after you go for a walk around the block. I think there's lots of different things that we can learn um, you know, by, by checking different times of day. And then just to clarify, usually we do say it's two hours after the start of the meal. Yes. Um, you know, that can get wishy-washy if it takes you a half an hour to eat your meal, but, um, generally that two hours, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's kind of the general idea that it, you don't want to check, you know, 30 minutes, an hour after you've eaten, because you'll, you'll see this kind of natural spike that we're not as worried about as kind of where you end up two hours later. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. And then somebody kind of put in the follow-up here, which I think we've already addressed, which is how many times a day should you check? And I think we kind of already addressed that, which it doesn't have to be the same every day, right? Would you agree that it's kind of different every single day? Um, you know, your provider may say checking it fasting every day, if you're on insulin, um, you know, it kind of depends on which medications you're on and, how many test strips you get a month and you know what kind of patterns we're trying to tease out would you would you both agree with that yeah i certainly agree with it um i have one patient he is he has type 2 diabetes and he pretty much eats about the same 20 foods uh, mm -hmm. on on a given week and and many of us eat pretty much the same things and then we deviate uh on certain occasions so he was pretty steady and he felt that he only wanted to test more often when there were certain changes in his life. Uh, like you said, uh, Trisha, if for example, he was going to eat something that he normally would not eat or many times he was at work for many hours and he wanted to know the effect of his physical activity at work on his blood glucose numbers. And then there was one time that he was under a lot of stress because his wife was pregnant and she was having a difficult time. And he noticed how his emotions, the stress was also changing his numbers. So it's a great way um, to have that GPS mm -hmm. and see, well, when are you going to need it the most? And then in some other cases, then you pretty much know that if it's the same things day to day, you might not be as vigilant. And I'm glad you brought that up because you know we do recommend anytime you have a medication change or perhaps you're ill or feeling ill to kind of kick that testing up. So to your point, I love that aspect of using it as a GPS and, and really sort of playing it by ear for when you might need to do more and when you can back off a little bit, so. Right. Now, while we're on the subject of testing our blood sugar, we have some other questions here that kind of relate and bring in CGM or those continuous glucose monitors. Um, you know, one just quickly here says, are there other factors that affect blood sugar such as anxiety? And I think you already brought this up, Lorena, which is, you know, stress, anxiety, pain, all of those things can really affect your blood sugar. So absolutely. And then the other question here says, my Libre often uses, loses accuracy after about 10 days. Is there a way to avoid this? Um, so let's talk about CGM accuracy for a minute because 
um, patients often when they go on CGM for the first time, they feel like, gosh, this thing isn't accurate. My meter is more accurate. Um, so is that true? And how do you tell patients to kind of trust the accuracy of this new machine when we've been using meters for so long? And what, do, what are your thoughts on educating patients in terms of that time span of a CGM and when it's most accurate? So we do a lot of, we do a lot of CGMs and a lot of training on that. And what I tell folks is about usually about that first day to kind of maybe do a little bit more finger stick checking. Depends on site placement. Once it's been in for about 24 hours, you'll see that accuracy improve. But one of the um, analogies that I use with folks is that the finger stick is right now current what it is. The CGM, there's a little bit of a lag time. That doesn't mean it's inaccurate. It's just looking at a different form of, of how it measures your glucose. So I kind of, um, reference it almost like a train where your finger stick is the is the engine and the CGM is the caboose. And so it's going to follow that pattern and that trend. So you have a little bit of lag time. Um, but, you know, certainly if you feel more comfortable the first 24, 48 hours, checking a little bit more, um, if you feel like you get an inaccurate reading where you feel like you're having symptoms that you're hyperglycemic, um, but, but the sensor isn't reading that double check, but that lag will shorten and it will become a little bit more current. But remember, it's, it's calculating of every three to five to seven minute ac, um, glucose. And so there's a little bit of that lag time, but that's not inaccurate. That's just the way it's, it's meant to be. So I don't know, Lorena, if you have any different advice on that. That is so interesting. I also use a train yeah. um, and that's because I'm in New York and, <laughs> uh, and I take the subway and I take the train. So I say, well, when the, when the subway, when the train enters the station, um, then you're going to see the motorman that he's, he's going to be there first. That's the first part that enters the station. And then you're going to have the last car. And then the last car is the one that enters. So, so it's a different times, but they all, they're all entering the station. They're just doing it at different times. So that's the analogy that I use here in New York. Great. Yeah. I've heard that train one before and I love it. I think it's so important for people to expect that your CGM and your meter are pretty much never going to read the exact same number. That would be kind of um, a shock if they did, you know, and, and I think it's important for patients to know that meters are not, you know, the gold standard anyway, actually, you know, the actual true blood sugar would be for us to, you know, poke your vein and get, you know, measure it in there. So, um, you know, none of these machines are perfect. And I think sometimes they can be way off. And in that case, you know, if one machine's telling you your blood sugar is 40 and you feel fine and you normally feel low blood sugars and you just ate a piece of cake, well, that doesn't make any sense, you know? So mm -hmm. you kind of have to look at what's logical. Um, but most of the time, I think these, these numbers being within, you know, 30 points or so, I mean, there's no mm -hmm. cutoff, but that really should be something that, that people expect. Yes. Um, and if you start to feel like, your CGM is not that accurate, you know, towards the end of the 10 day or 14 day period, then you want to do what Melissa was saying in the beginning, which is, you know, just start doing finger sticks a little more frequently. You may have to, you know, double up on your measurements for a couple of days in the beginning and the end at the worst case scenario. And I also want to add um, because many times I, I read and people ask me about different glucometers. And sometimes that usually occurs in they, if they live in a family, um, that there are various members of the family who have diabetes and they have different meters and they start using different meters mm -hmm. and they start to get very confused because of the discrepancy in the numbers. And I usually say the same things. They are not supposed to be exact. They are not supposed to mirror one another. So, so don't worry, just keep your meters, check your symptoms, and check the results and look what happens with the trends so that you don't go crazy trying to compare. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really, you know, we don't want, we don't, none of us here want you to give up on that CGM because no. you think that it's not accurate. So just remember the meter isn't perfect either. So just because they say two different numbers, it doesn't mean the meter's right and the CGM's wrong. Right. So yeah. it's all that kind of logical thing that we were saying. Okay. Let's move on from, um, from 
kind of glucose checks for now and talk a little bit about the GLP-1 and SGLT-2 inhibitors. Um, I also see we have one other panelist who has joined us. Um, Dr. Adubafor, did I pronounce your name correctly? You did, you did, and I'm so sorry I'm late. That's okay. Thanks a, so much for being here. Have a rather busy morning. Do you want Thank to pause you. for, why don't we pause for a second and let you introduce yourself? Oh, terrific. What did everybody say about themselves? They said, you know, I'm what their background is joking. and where they work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so I do primary care internal medicine with an emphasis on diabetes because I had some training in diabetology many moons ago. And unfortunately, this practice, when I started out 20 years ago, was your typical primary care practice. But now, anywhere from 60 to 80% of the patients we see on a daily basis are here because of a diabetes-related problem. So we become rather good at making sure that we are good to our patients. Because what I say is that there's nothing more abhorrent than calling a patient non-compliant. When you, as a clinician, you're not doing everything in your power to ensure that that patient uh, does well or is able to look after them with this disease appropriately. So it's been a lot of fun introducing our residents as well as our medical students to some of the concepts that we feel are important when you're managing a chronic disease like diabetes in a primary care environment. Is that, is that, is that enough? Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, we are just moving on. We were talking about glucose monitoring for a bit. And um, I do see some questions coming in about GLP-1 and SGLT-2 medications. So I want to ask you a few questions on this. Um, you know, one question someone had is having an adverse effect of hiccups um, while oh, taking wow. Ozempic and whether or not um, switching to a different GLP-1 would be, you know, helpful. What do you tell your patients, you know, hiccups can happen. Um, probably the most common side effect with GLP-1 medications is nausea, a little bit of nausea. Right, right, right. Um, what do you all tell your patients in terms of, you know, the, the benefits of these medications and how to kind of balance that with the adverse effects they may feel and whether or not kind of switching, you know, amongst others in the class is helpful? I'll, I'll jump right in on that. Um, one of the, you know, the top things that you mentioned, Tricia, was the fact that you can have gastrointestinal or stomach type issues that a lot of folks call those side effects. Um, we tend to, to reference those as potentially um, expected expectations or effects if you overeat on these drugs. So part of what these drugs do in, the, in this category is they slow down gastric emptying, meaning they slow down how quickly food leaves your stomach. So if I overstretch my stomach, I'm going to get uncomfortable. I'm going to feel overly full or what some folks call, call nausea, nausea. So what we tell folks right out of the gate is expect to feel uncomfortable if you overeat. That's, a, that's an expected ex, uh, side effect if you overeat. So usually you're going to get that across the board in the class, regardless of which drug in the class you're on, um, because they all have that mechanism of action. So really from drug to drug throughout the class, um, really being consistent with size of meal, eating slowly, those types of things to really kind of combat some of that. That's a great tip. You know, I, I don't think I've, although I talk about these adverse effects. I don't think I ever tell my patients up front to try and eat smaller meals, but that's a great tip. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. one of the things about the adverse effects with the, the GI symptoms that you're mentioning is your body tends to get used to these medications, which is why we start at a, at a lower dose um, and then kind of march up very mm -hmm. slowly. Um, Lorena, Dr. Adu, before, do you have any other thoughts or, or tips that you tell patients when starting this class? I have Lorena um, go first. Yes. So, so in, in my case, the, it has already been prescribed. Uh, I just, uh, usually when I go over the medication, which is not as extensive because I'm focused more on, on nutrition and uh, blood glucose management, but I always want to let uh, everyone know that, that if they experience side effects, 
the worst thing to do is just to discontinue the medication and then wait to see the doctor. I find that that usually happens. And then when I am checking their medications and how they're taking, then uh, the dose may not be the same because they don't feel that they need a higher dose. Uh, that happens often. So it's more the part of education, you know, telling them what is the medication for, what could be expected, what are some of the most common side effects. The same thing that, um, that many times this side effects will disappear. And if they don't, they need to reach out to their team so that they can make the adjustment necessary. But I would say, I always keep telling people, please do not stop the medication and then wait until you see the doctor to tell them I stopped the medication a month ago or two months ago. So to do the first thing is just reach out to your team. Terrific. And, and I agree with both of them because it's really important for the patient to understand the mechanism of action of these drugs that yes, they go straight up to the brain as well to control the way your satiety center works. Yes, you're going to have some nausea, but I agree with Melissa, you cannot continue to eat the same big portions while you're on, this, on these agents. So you need to really decrease the amount of food you're eating. And the amazing thing is that if you discuss the side effects with the patients and they fully, are fully aware of it, the tendency to stop the medication is so much less than if you start playing Lord hype, you know, everything else. And just um, because I'm the doctor, I'm asking you to take this medication without any explanation whatsoever, then you're going to get problems. So it's really crucial that as part of managing this chronic disease, we take our time to really educate the patients as to the mechanism of action of these agents every single time you're prescribing uh, a diabetes related drug, you need to have to go through that exercise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, we've, we've kind of harped on the downsides to GLP ones, but why don't we talk about some of the upsides? Um, there's a question here from someone who is already on Ozempic and is wondering about GLP ones or SGLT twos. These are all such a mouthful to say. Mm -hmm. um, for patients, but I think you've heard the classes today, really the newest classes that we have, which aren't so new anymore, are the GLP ones and the SGLT twos. And both of these have some serious benefits now. Um, and one of the questions in here says they're actually concerned about these medications, um, having a family history of heart failure. Now, this is confusing because there's been a lot of diabetes medications in the past that have had issues with the heart, but Let's talk about the benefits to the heart with SGLT2s and GLP1s and what type of patients may benefit from this who have different kinds of heart disease. So um, that's a great question because there is so much news in this space and, and it can get a little confusing. And so what we typically, our approach is both of these classes of medications have had really positive results in cardiovascular outcome trials. What with ASCVD or what we call atherosclerotic um, heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, those types of things. And then the SGLT2s have had more of that heart failure kidney, but both of them have shown um, really good benefit for, for those who are living with diabetes and at risk for heart disease or already have some form of heart disease. Well, that's kind of a vicious circle because we know that having type 2 diabetes and somewhat type 1 diabetes puts you at risk for that. Um, and so we know all of the societies that we follow that make recommendations for treatment algorithms say, you know, think about this first. Think about family history, that patient's history and risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, when looking to prescribe drugs because of the benefits. We know both of these classes lower blood sugars. We know the GLP-1s have some fairly significant weight loss, which we know is a risk reduction. Um, so we typically look at the patient, speak, speak to the patient about what their biggest risk is. Are they someone who's more at risk for a heart attack or stroke, or they've had that event and they're a little heavier and need to lose a significant amount of weight, we start with a GLP-1 first. If they're more along the lines for heart failure, which we know we've seen about 30%, 30 to 60% of folks with diabetes may need to deal with that issue right. and maybe don't need as much weight loss to begin with, we'll start with an SGLT-2, but I'd be interested to, to see um, other folks' perspective on this. 
Doctor Adu before, how do you no, no, kind of that, I mean, choose between these two? Can I take Melissa with me back to Stockton when we're done? <laughs> this yes, is I would love a Melissa in my pocket. This is absolutely fantastic yes. because that's precisely the point. So yesterday we had, yesterday was the day of 11s, I'll call it at the clinic, because nearly every phone call we made was to a patient with an A1C above 10 yesterday. It was, the, it was mm. just absolutely crazy. So my question to the two medical students who were here was, if we have a new patient now who comes in with diabetes, what are some of the things you're going to consider before prescribing any agent? And so, you know, after all the long discussion, I said, well, the real answer to that question is it depends. And it depends, meaning that everything that Melissa went through is what you now have to sit down with the patient and decide. Are you at risk for continued kidney disease as a result of the diabetes? Are you at risk for continued heart failure as a result of the diabetes? Are you at risk for ongoing coronary ischemia as a result of diabetes? So we have agents that impact these areas now. So just to tell me, you know, without any pause or any thought that you're starting everybody on metformin and that's the only thing you're going to go for is a mistake. So what I want you, the way I want you to answer that question is, yes, it depends. And then go through the algorithm that allows you to really risk stratify and choose appropriate medications for the right patient at that right moment. So everything that Melissa said is just right on in terms of the way those of us in primary care dealing with diabetes on a daily basis ought to think. And I think that's such an important point because patients tend to want to think there is you know, one way to prescribe mm -hmm. these medications for everyone. And it's just, that's why we as providers have so much fun with, with type two diabetes mm -hmm. because no patients are alike. No exactly. two patients are alike. Exactly. And we have to use different medicines. Sometimes it's, you know, there was a, a question in here for a patient who says, my blood sugar is over 300 and I'm, I don't know what to eat um, for lunch. So maybe we can kind of roll that into, you know, another, re another thing that we factor into is, how much do we need to bring the blood sugar down? You know, do, are, is the medication we're choosing strong enough to do the job? Um, you yeah. know, that's another factor. Lorena, but, but, how do you, you know, talk to patients about eating when your blood sugar is high? Because this, this person here says, maybe I should just drink water and not eat. And of course, that's, that's not correct. True, that's right? not the so, answer because many yeah. times um, I, I feel that that is not the answer to the question uh, or the solution to the problem. What I would like to know is many things. It's not just what do you need to eat, but what is going on in your life that your blood sugar is 300? I think that that's the first thing that I would ask anyone. Is it because it, it's usually 300? Is it because it's just 300 now? Uh, what other medications are you, are you taking? And when did you take the medication? Or if you took insulin, then I need to know what else is going on instead of just saying, well, just have a salad and a glass of water because I would like to tackle the, the issue. And the issue is that it's 300. So my answer would vary depending on this person's answers to my questions. If it's, well, yes, I did take my medication and now it's 300, but did you eat something an hour ago, two hours ago? So I don't know. It would be very hard for me to just answer the question without getting some answers. I know that I didn't provide the answer that the person may want to hear, <laughs> but, but I think that those are the things uh, that I would want to know first. So, so once again, it's individualized, right? Exactly, yes, yes. exactly. If there I went go. over to, to Dr. Radu before and right. just say, I am in horrible pain, um, should I get Tylenol? And then the question would be not yes or no, you can't have the Tylenol, but where is the pain? What's going uh, on? When did it start? Yeah. How, you know, uh, how high is the pain? He would need to find out more before giving me an answer or a prescription. 
Right. So, Trish, what, what I always say is that the idea, right, that those of us in primary care managing all these patients yet do not ever, ever discuss prandial glucose management with a patient, it just, it just befuddles me. So, so what we've done here is that you will have to come back to us in two weeks. We're not doing too much face-to-face -face as we used to before COVID, but at least call us with your two-hour postprandial blood sugars as well. And we're not asking you to poke yourself three, four times a day. If your insurance won't pay for continuous glucose monitoring device, all we want you to do is at least take one meal every day, breakfast one day, lunch the following day, dinner the following day, and report back to us what the impact of those food portions are on your blood sugars. The idea that we have people managing this chronic disease and don't know what happens to me if I eat a, a boiled egg and two slices of toast for breakfast? What's my postprandial blood sugar? Is it within the ADA guidelines or is it 300? And if it's 300, instead of two slices of toast, is one slice the magic number to go with? The, the number of people who walk into this clinic who have no clue as to the role monitoring the type of food and writing down the type of food and gaining that power to be able to go anywhere with any loved one and look at whatever buffet that's laid out and say, okay, I know for a fact that if I eat this, that, and that, two hours hence, my blood sugar is going to be 300. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have something that will completely allow the medications I've taken and my blood sugar excursions to be perfectly between at least 140 to 180. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a task that I'm pleading with anyone here who is involved in the primary care of diabetes to really make sure patients understand. The A1C is not enough. You may be able to get a good A1C, but what's a good A1C if it's between, because the blood sugars are between 600 and 50? That's going to give you a good A1C as well. But the person runs the risk of hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia, both very dangerous to the patient you're looking after. So testing around meals, not forever and ever, for at least two weeks as a new patient to really understand the impact of food and infrequently, to, especially for patients who are having problems, is absolutely crucial if you want to understand how to manage this disease. Just purely relying on insulin, relying on medications and thinking that, oh, the medications I'm taking are going to bring the blood sugars down is not good enough. Food and the way you manage food is crucial when it comes to managing this disease. I, I agree. And I think, you know, I think it's important for patients to understand, you know, part of what you just said, which is that they have permission to eat eat those things that you love and then right. check your blood sugar so we can actually see what's happening, right? That's so, it. so if you're only, if as a patient, you're only checking your blood sugar the three days before you come in, because we told you to, which is great, but you're eating perfectly for those three days and we don't know anything about, you know, what you're doing the other time, it's not going to be helpful for you. So, no. you know, no. being able to see it, patients don't even need any of us providers to tell them what to do with those food when they check those numbers before. Exactly. After, right? That's the key right there. Very right. good point. I keep, I keep on saying you're the boss. Mm -hmm. It's not the food. You're the boss. Right. But you really need to understand just what the food does to you. So that if, if uh, Lorena calls you up for, for Thanksgiving, Melissa calls you up for Thanksgiving, and you see the spread of food in front of you, and you know very well that after you consume A, B, C, and D, your blood sugar is going to go to 500. Why are you consuming A, B, and C, and D? But if you don't know, then you continue to do, quote Correct. unquote, the wrong thing when it's and so the easy to resolve. important thing to remember, it. too, is that, you know, what that I think is very important for patients to remember is that just because you're not checking when you're, you know, overeating or eating different things doesn't mean those numbers aren't there. There you so, go. you know, so 
so go ahead and check because and let us see the numbers because if we see the numbers we can help you right if Lorena mm -hmm. sees the numbers and asks you what you ate she can help you manage exactly that exactly right that's so, the key right there yeah okay well we only have about five minutes left unfortunately these panels are always so great that they go but they fly by too quickly <laughs> so um why don't we start just kind of wrap up by each of you telling us kind of your parting words of wisdom that you want to leave with everyone today. Lorena, why don't we start with you? Okay, so since food is my passion and love, I would definitely start with food. And I would just like to share that for those of you who have a, who have a uh, CGM, that is a wonderful tool to actually look at your trends and see how food and other things is affecting your diabetes. Uh, there are many different, and for those of you that are using the glucometer, you can certainly use that to guide you. Remember, use it as your GPS. And then when it comes to foods, I would always say, try and focus on the healthiest foods that you can access, the ones that you enjoy, and the ones that fit into your lifestyle. Try different foods and uh, different amounts of foods and see how you can tweak until you can get to those numbers. Uh, there are many different meal patterns that can fit for anyone who has diabetes. So when you hear all these wars about low carb, high carb, low fat, keto, plant-based, etc., know that whatever it is that you choose, that it probably can fit. And if you have not seen a dietitian who specializes in diabetes care, I do urge you to speak with your healthcare team so that they can refer you to one. And enjoy your food. There you go. Thank you. I love that you said enjoy your food because yeah. patients with diabetes think that they can no longer eat carbs and no that's, longer enjoy food. That's and that's exactly. Not true. So I love that you wrapped up with that. Melissa. Um, it may sound cliche, but knowledge is power. And it's a two-way street with that knowledge because for, for those living with type 2 diabetes, having that knowledge of knowing what to do, asking questions every time you see your practitioner. Um, you know, what I, I start my visits with, what are the top three things you want to learn today? Not necessarily what I know I need to get through to the patient or the person living with diabetes, but what do you want to learn today? And I can't help you if I don't have that knowledge behind me as well either. What is your lifestyle? What are your needs? What are your goals? Um, so this constant communication with your healthcare team is just key because to your point, Tricia, we can individualize and should be individualizing treatment so much more now. Um, the tools that we have are amazing. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and what we had to offer back then is certainly, you know, paltry compared to what we have now. So keep learning, keep asking questions. And it's a two-way street with your practitioner as far as that communication. Excellent. Very well Excellent. said. Agree completely. Dr. Adu before. So knowledge is power. I mean, that's the key right there. When you walk into our waiting room, there's a big signage on the wall that says that if you're here because of diabetes, here is what we're going to do together as a team to ensure that you do well. And it provides a listing of everything that we expect to do because the ADA says that's what we're supposed to do. That is on the wall only because we want to really emphasize what Melissa said. If you do not know what to expect from your providers, you're going to get shortchanged. The doctor's not the boss. You are the boss. You're coming to see, the doctor is a technician, is what I keep on saying all the time. Mm -hmm. We're just technicians. So as long as you're learning about the disease, as long as you know what to respect, you know that, that your feet has to be examined, insist on everything that the ADA says that clinic has to provide for you. So please, please, please read as much as you can get on the ADA website, know that you're supposed to have your cholesterol check, your feet examined, you're supposed to see your eye doctor. Do not wait for the clinic to do all those things for you. You come in there ready with your list. So when do I get this done? When do I get number two done? When do I get number three done? Absolutely crucial for you to realize you are the boss. The te technicians 
other doctors, the nurses, other technicians helping you get on top of this disease. Really important for the patients to realize this. I agree with you completely. And I think that's, you know, so much of the message of TCOID is really putting the patient in the driver's seat. In You're charge. your own exactly. advocate. You know, patients, often, diabetes is hard for us providers to keep up with. It's changing all the time. So the more you know, sometimes you'll know something, you know, remind your provider that you, you know, something's out there for them. So exactly. I agree with you all so much. Thank you so much for being here today. I can't believe that went by so quickly. Um, thank you. But thank you so much to our panelists as well for your time today. And thanks for my tardy. Sorry for my tardy. <laughs> Take care. No problem. We're so happy you could make it. I have to go chase after a little white ball. <laughs> okay.